Oh, I need to upgrade, uh, upgrade, update rather that little piece at the top, oh, won't I? Because we don't have BCQ in this one. But we do have a Marine Lord. The monkey is still about. And the Muslim has joined him here. The Muslim once again on the Ottomans. Ottomans that he really sees as like his favorite Civ right now. I remember he said like, you know, regardless of what it used to be right now, he feels like his favorite Civ to, to play, what he's enjoying a lot and what he thinks has a lot of potential is the Ottomans. So kind of fitting he's playing them again. And joining him, it is going to be Marine Lord on the English, which is kind of fitting as well. Because I feel like whenever we talk about, especially uh, water maps, it's more or less been Marine Lord's go-to, right? In the Road to Wall Law and Beyond. And oh, sorry, I'm losing the, the text there. Um, in the Road to Wall Law, he loved the English, especially on maps like Holy Island. And I think that definitely translated when we moved into the Wall Law Legacy tournament as we saw him pull out a decent amount of English, especially on Mediterranean. Uh, I recall especially that one game where he went for an Abbey of Kings drop right on the edge. That was the game, I believe, that he lost against Magic on the opening day. Sorry to bring up the stinger of a memory for him. Um, but let's see what he's got in mind this game. I don't think, if I remember correctly, Abbey of Kings, I'm not sure if it f actually affects allies. If it does, that's a huge element for the English in team games on Mediterranean specifically. Because I think Medi is a lot more feasible to set up Abbey of Kings next to the waterfront than any other what map in rotation. On the other side as well, we're going to have Sword and Undying. Sword playing as the Mongols. And Undying, of course, as the Chinese up here in the purple. Uh, these guys are fairly talented. In fact, I believe Undying is 29th in the world on the 1v1 ladder, uh, or ranked. And then Sword, I think, is a diamond level player. He's like top 200. So it should not be a pushover by any measure. And they did go for the Mongol Chinese, which I feel like can work quite well together, actually. So the Chinese, of course, we, we know their advantages with the extra build speed they have on Warsaw, also the extra 20% on supervised drop-off on land. The cool thing about the Mongols, however, is the piracy that we haven't really seen so far. Remember, they have this piracy tech. They unlock in Feudal Age. As you can see there, every ship you sink, you get 25 wood and gold. This gives a snowball -y effect to the water side. And it's definitely feasible that they could take full control of water when you consider that they're up against the Ottomans and the English. So no HRE, Abbasid, or Chinese powerhouse staring them down from the other side of the lake. I'm also curious to see if we're going to get to the tier three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I'm looking for. I remember I was talking to a few of the guys because they didn't get like... They didn't really get a chance to, to try it enough to use it in competitive. But I remember I was talking, I think it's the Muslim I talked about. He mentioned this, like they were experimenting with it and they discovered this, the Grand Galley. You, you're seeing that correctly. It can be upgraded into a naval military school, which sounds bonkers. I think that's what the Muslim's aiming for in this game. I'm not sure if he'll reach that point though. Like a lot of the time when we watch Mediterranean, people get sucked back into feudal over and over again. I think where the Muslim could find the wiggle room is, let's say he gets enough extra eco to build you know, two military schools and a blacksmith on land and feudal, he could build a small army and he could egress into his opponent's base. And that would force them to knee-jerk react on land, which means that he wouldn't need to defend his hard on water anymore. For now, we're just going to see the fishing spam for both sides. Let me check the lay of the lands, actually. Spawns look... Pretty decent all around. Double wood line accessible to a good degree. Uh, no one has that kind of HRE suffering where it's like, oh, you know, this this is going to munch for a wood line quickly, but after that, I have to move far, far away. I think everyone got pretty balanced spawns to their wood, which is important. The Mongol player got a little bit screwed, but that's for their own choice, right? They pulled the TC further to one of the wood lines. It means they're sacrificing the other. And that might become very important if we see the Muslim do a land switch at some point. Because he'll be able to block out the wood to keep that, that kind of escalation going. But Sword goes a different way. He's actually going for the Silver Tree. Makes a lot of sense, right? Yam is cool, but the Deer Stone doesn't have that military value. Also, on a map like this, with all the tension likely being on water from both sides, you're probably going to get to sneak trade. And it looks like both sides are having the same idea. Because the Muslim goes in for the Sultani trade network. Now, it could be for him. It's just because you don't really want the alternative, right? You don't really need a madrissa when you have all this fishing. But I've got a funny feeling both sides might be considering trade. Which is interesting because if you remember, they changed the way that naval system works. You don't really need gold for your springle ships or your archer ships. You can see springle ships only take 30 gold each. The only reason you really need gold is if you're looking to mass demo ships. 
And it looks like we aren't going to get the Abbey of Memes play this time. I wonder if that's because Marino didn't want to walk that far. He doesn't have wheelbarrow, right? So walking that far out to build an Abbey of Kings would be pretty frustrating. Or it might be possible that it doesn't affect allies. I feel like it does. I can't think of a reason why it wouldn't. On the other side, it is going to, of course, be the Imperial Academy. We'll see if the trade does get activated. So far, it's not being interacted with by sword. But that's because he needs more wood to get military units out, remember? And it looks like the Muslim, he'll be going to the Spring Ults. Everyone but Undying is going Spring Ults. So Undying, instead, is actually going into Archer ships alongside Spring Ults straight away. He's going all three types of units. This could be pretty effective, actually, just getting one demo ship super early in team games, simply because there's more players pushing Springholds. Of course, the flip side of that is there's probably more players pushing Archer ships as well, right? So, always something to think about. I'm wondering if there's any kind of techs we're expecting to come out early for the Chinese. I don't think they have any unique ones for Feudal Age, right? They will come out in Castle and Beyond. But I think most of the unique techs are Imperial, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I really want to get to a situation where we start seeing the, the Thunderclap bombs, which is a nest of bees on the Baojuans. We'd have to get pretty late for that. I kind of want us to get that late, though, on both sides. There's so many interesting things I've yet to see explored. Clash coming out. Right next to the, the fishing side of things, they need to be careful. Oh, that hit onto the Springholds. Demo ship getting maximum impact. That's going to sink one of the Springholds. And now, the Muslim's in quite the pickle. He's going to pull back all the fishing boats, but the archer ships can spray them down. In fact, if you just take all the archer ships and target the fishing boats instead, they're all going to die. They even have enough right now. I think the issue might be that they simply just... They, they have three. They should be targeting the archer ships, but instead they don't. Demu will be able to hold for the moment. But it feels like that initial hit, almost losing two Springles, has now set the Muslim far behind. Marine Lord is yelling, you baboon, at his teammate, saying, why am I covering everything else for you? The boom ship comes in. Heavy hit there. War jumps almost going down. Follow-up is going to be good. Now, Marine Lord is looking like the strong armor here. Plenty of hulks to play with. Boom ship chasing him once again. Never going after Marine Lord. Instead, he's going to target down one of the Spring Olds. And more demo ships come behind it. Now, the, the, the upside right now for the Eastern team here is the demo ships are mainly coming from the Northern players. So they're coming further away. If at any stage, Sword starts pushing demo ships as well, they can sink the entire fleet because of how quickly they can get involved. Pushing again. Feels like, despite how good this is looking in the terms of damage they're doing to the Muslim, Marine Lord is escalating off the back of each of these fights. So they do need to address the English player before he swarms them. Trip Demo ship coming out, though. That's going to give chase. Archer ships are going to turn around. Tries to dodge out the shots. Unable to do so, though. That's three Demo ships wasted. Great micro out of Marine Lord. You won't let him have it easy. Are we seeing any land switch ups as well? I've been waiting. We have got trade coming out. It looks like the trade was getting harassed a little by the Khan. No trade coming out yet from Sword, which is awkward, right? If he actually has set up some trade, he could afford the demo ships. Maybe they're able to do some damage there. Instead, all pressure still remains on Undying. Undying, who's only really been able to afford boom ships, partially because of the tax, right? Like, yes, he's got a few people in gold, but the rest of it is coming out of taxation. This is where we might start seeing blacksmiths get prepped. Looks like the Chinese player is going to be the first one to jump upon it. Quick build up for him. That means he can upgrade the damage output of these archer ships, remember. Plus one five times, so an extra five damage. And his goal right now, because he's relying heavily on archer ships, is to get up to maybe about 12 to 15 of these bad boys. At which stage you can start dealing with Springholds, as long as it's not an even number. Which is hard to be, really, when you consider the cost difference here. You can see 240 resources for light junks and 350 for war junks. Or for Springholds. Clash coming out, though. All those Spring ships are now starting to move in. They're going to easily be able to blitz their way through their opponents here. Arch ships trying to assist from the side, but not able to add much damage in just yet. And they really need demo ships out of sword. He just doesn't have the goal to do so. Demo ships have to come from Undying instead. Good micro back will minimize damage done by the demos. Arch ships now being added in by Demuslim. No demo ships of their own yet, considering they are up against quite a few archer ships. Yeah, just go on the defensive. Good strike back. Undying. Needs to be careful not to get body blocked by his teammate here. He's not easily able to reach with these archer ships. Remember, Springles have a little bit of better range here. Six tower range compared to the... Wait, 6.5? What? Why aren't they attacking? 
Right, they're drunk driving. Actually, in fairness, it makes sense because the boats are, I think, about one tile thick. So if you're behind them, you naturally can't attack. So you kind of have to have this formation, but it means you're, if your teammate doesn't move closer with the spring ships, it ends up really bad for you because you're just not attacking. And every time I look at the end of these fights, I feel like the Muslim's coming out worse for it. Marine Lord is doing a good job of maintaining, but it feels like overall, left team is getting slightly more out of these exchanges. Maybe if the Muslim's able to switch onto land in some capacity, just just get like a one or two military schools down and, and begin a push. I could see this starting to pivot the other way, but as it stands, zero land force coming out from the, the Ottomans. Okay, not zero totally. He's got one, he's got a scout, but we don't really count that. And now we've got what I've been waiting for. It's finally in line for sword. He's got boom ships. He didn't actually go for trade in the end. Did he go for pirate? No, no piracy. So he just harvested the gold. I still think piracy could be pretty good for him here, especially considering that they're fighting around the economy of their opponent, which means that you'll naturally take out a few fishing boats as well. And each of those fishing boats are also worth 25 wood and gold. And why that's important, by the way, is once you get enough like out of piracy, you can start to escalate your boom ship count. It almost feels counterintuitive, yes, because um, the way that demo ships work, I believe piracy doesn't trigger if you blow them up. It's only when you sink them, which is a very weird interaction. I don't think they ever fixed that. I think that was intended in their eyes. Boom ships come in, though. Decent damage done to Marine Lord. They forced the fight now. They need to get more demo ships involved in this. Springles are starting to pick them apart a little. No demo ships coming out just yet. And notice that once again, the Dow is tanking all the damage. So decent value maintained for Marine Lord for the time being. Demo ship was not able to sneak in. And it feels like they maybe jumped the gun. Not enough archer ships coming in this fight. Once again, the Springles are going to reign supreme. I love the flurry of damage the Muslims being bringing on the side. He did go into the archer ships and he went into the extra range damage. So he's getting impact. Demo ships, however, are not. Now, once again, push them back somewhat. So fishing is once again exposed. But the problem is momentum just doesn't feel like it's their perma. There's definitely some territorial gain, but now you offer up an opportunity where Marine Lord and the Muslim can push back. Demo ships, demo ships, Marine Lord. He was heading straight for him for a sec there. Quick reaction just in time. Behind this. I love the fact that Marine Lord has stretched around. Like, he's just spreading his eco out. He's trying to boom up, and it's a race between him and Undying on the north side as well, who's doing the same. Of course, Undying can be more efficient about it. Not only do his docks produce quicker, but he also builds them initially faster. Oh, just surviving on one HP apiece. And damn, Sword still hasn't got a Blacksmith yet. It's finally coming through, but remember, it's going to take some time to get into Steeled Arrows. That was the difference maker, right? And it's very important that Undying done this. He went into the Steeled Arrows very quickly at the start of these naval engagements, which allowed them to somewhat pad themselves in these fights. If it wasn't for that and say the Muslim had got you know, the, the Steeled Arrows first and that was it, this would begin to look one-sided, but it can now look one-sided because one issue I do see, Marine Lord has done a great job of keeping his boats alive and massing hulks. But because he's massed hulks, he has no interest in blacksmiths and no interest in steeled arrows. Means that his opponents might reach the critical mass of archer ships required to saturate the fights, and they'll saturate those fights with an extra five damage done per ship on each round of attacks. It sounds like it's, it's nitpicky, but it's not. It's actually a lot of damage. Especially considering, like, in this situation, you've got over half your damage going through the health of the hulks, uh, through the arm of the hulks. And one of the key issues with Sin is in small numbers, Springles do correctly counter archer ships. But when you go up to 30, 40, mass Springles becomes a detriment to your existence because you start stacking them too close together. And it means that although you do more damage to these archer ships individually, these archer ships end up attacking two, three, maybe four ships at the same time. So there's going to be a peel back for the moment. Demo ships are waiting to go in. A wraparound, a pinch on the way here. Demos are making their way in. Archer ships aren't covering it either. The Dows went a little bit too wide. Marine Lord has to retreat. He's going to take heavy hits here. Final ship's going to go through, and that is going to be deep enough. Sinks the second one, the Spiral ships, and then the retreat. It looks like the Archer boats are going to be swarmed. Sword able to overwhelm the Muslim and push him back. Northside is a win as well, and just like that, that circle around, the patience from Undying to come around on the north side has now given them control in the water. And this will start to snowball. 
Archer ship count is just too high. I don't think the Spruils have an answer anymore. Just look how quickly they die. More demos coming through as well. And this is the worrying detail I see in the balance of the water. It's like every time a demo ship shows up, Spruils have to run. They can't fight anymore. And on the exit, these Archer ships are picking them apart. Barfruit continues. Count is now looking damn good for the Western team. Dimu, he has what, four archer ships left? The Spring ship count has been cut in half from Marine Lord. It might be cut down to nothing. Last of them retreating. I'm still not seeing any switch into land. Just a few troops coming out from the Muslim, but nothing that's really going to threaten quick enough now. And it's a shame for him because this would, would be the time to do it. You can see that Sword is out here without Yam and without Wheelbarrow. A few archers could do so much damage in the back lines, but instead the damage has been done to their back lines. Fishing has been shut down. The Muslim's going to lose all of it. And this is the power of the archer ships. Once you reach your opponent's economy, the ability to burst is insane. That, they're going to start moving north because they know now that they've shut down the Muslim, there's just one person left with an economy here. But not for long. Archer ships. Pick off the last. Now, this is the moment where you live in a prayer. You're like, don't look north, don't look north, don't see me. But one, just one horseman snitches. They know about the docks now, so they can go up there looking for the fishing boats as well. And this should be the moment where we see a switch into Springholds. Just get four to eight Springhold ships and kill off all the docks. Seems like for now they aren't going into it, but this has maybe been the, the one awkward issue I've seen for people with mass archer ships is they never stop. Right? They don't know when they've won. They just keep doing it. And the problem is you don't kill docks quickly. Docks that, remember, are more tanky these days. They used to be 1,500 HP, but they increased the health pool to 2,000 now. Oh, God, this is, this is signs of desperation, the switch from the land. Lombo's coming out from Marine Lord. He's at least making his way up, so signs of life potential with the King's Palace being built up. But I feel like your timing's going to be matched now because you've lost water entirely. And we can see how strong the fishing is going to be for the other side. Remember, the only reason these numbers don't look as good for them is because they're forced to keep reinvesting what they gain from fishing into military boats. That's no longer going to be the case. Oh, God, the Muslim. He did. He got the piracy. Oh, my. look at the resource gain. This is what I was talking about. It's such great bang for buck. You pay 350 resources, you get paid 50 resources per boat killed. It's a damn effective tech. Glad to see it coming out. It's like Marine Lord, instead of going for one or two cheeky boom ships, he's just going to get the Iris Lits going. So that will at least deter the Archer ships from diving in. But it might be difficult to still reboom uh, still re your eco on, on water here. Walls are also going to start going down as people negotiate where the terrain, or where the territory is, rather. And looks like Sorp was actually finally trying to go into trade. <laughs> A little bit late there, buddy. A little bit late. He'll at least go north side. That's still open for him. Looks like landmass is coming in, undying. Starting to move across. Now, they could switch into transport ships here. It wouldn't be the worst of ideas. Sneak in those bad lads drop them on your opponent's side a little bit risky right if you get caught out but remember that boom ships don't directly counter transport ships anymore and transport ships have quite a lot of health so you could easily make your way across i would especially love to see him do it once he makes his way up like this we see the clock tower coming out from the chinese player um just maybe get a, a nest of bees and a bunch of pass guards sit them in transport ship go across I'm very obsessed with the transport ship idea because no one's really doing it that much in competitive right now, but it's, it's a 100 resource unit that will move you across a map like Mediterranean twice as quickly. Even more so when you consider you have to go through walls now if you go on land. Tech ups are kicking through. Sword is the last one to make his way up, but not by much. So everyone now in Castle Age, but remember... East side does not have naval influence anymore, but they're going to try it. We are seeing it. De Muslim, he's built the Leviathan. Grand galleys are hitting the field. This is what we're talking about. This button here. Press it, and you can convert it into a military school. Press it. Just press it. I know you want to press it. Just press it. You definitely don't want to use this to attack, right? 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 Good God, that damage. It's easy to sleep on how much damage it actually does. It's uh, 110 damage. <laughs> it hits hard. Has damn good range as well. He's like, stay away from my children. 
I think they're fine to stay away, Ben. They basically got the rest of the lake for themselves. And he's got more of them coming. So more Grand Galleys on the way. They do use five pop cap each. It's pretty good because you should be able to get two Flurries to attack off before your opponent gets in range, right? So not easy for them to sink you. And it looks like he went for the extra health. So these boys are bulky. 900 HP per Grand Galley. They are not going down easily. I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Imperial Fleet if he wants to mass these as well, right? Because I think they, they are gunpowder. They do count. So you'd be able to produce them quicker and they'd have more movement speed. It's a unique tech for the, the Ottomans. We'll start at least up, so they're not going to be rushed on land anytime soon. But what is the end goal here? Realistically, if you get enough of these guys together, you can surge across the, the naval side and take out the docks, right? Because these get bonus damage against Siege. You, don't, you might not get a chance. Look at the archer ship damage. Galleys are just gone. One's going to sink. Archer ship, like, archer ships are taking out the fishing boats as well. I mean, this just doesn't work. It's like the Muslim was frustrated about how cheesy archer ship spam is. He's like, well, what if I just cheese them with grand galleys? Not the same thing. Oh, God. And these weren't cheap, folks. Look at the price on these. This is insane what you're paying. That's 810 resources each. 810. And they're just gone. Demo ships. I'm pretty sure demo ships, do they, get, do they get bonus damage against the galleys? I haven't seen this. It's against broadsides, right? I think they are technically broadsides. Okay, maybe not. Because broadsides would suggest they shoot from the side. Let's not be an idiot about this. They shoot from the forward. <laughs> He's just holding them down. He's like, okay. The flashiness blows it up in the end. I, that, that's the Grand Fleet dead. You can try to rebuild it, but the price to do so is so crippling in this type of game. Not to mention the fact you're about to be killed on land. Look at the lances they got in. Now, remember what I said about the price of these. He paid 810 resources per. He lost five? Losing more than that. That's over 4,000 uh, 4, resources. Imagine if that was an army on land. That's the, arm, that's the price of the army that he's missing to defend right now. And as a result... He's just going to get butchered. Sword with the dive in. North side, Marine Lord is at least holding on for the, the meantime. But the issue is now he has to defend north and south because all of a sudden, the Muslims' walls have failed him. They're in. They're unleashed. And they are not going to slow down. Oh, he's going to quickly be wiped here. Trey's at least trying to keep the, the Mullah in, going into the pockets of the Muslim. But I just look at this. A small group of archer ships will still wipe him out. Because remember, the difference here is that we are in Castle Age. Something that's very easy to forget is these archer ships continue to escalate because they get access to an extra one range damage. So that's another five damage. Not to mention the fact that at this stage, you also get the hammocks. So you get the extra burst. You can see that the these, these junks, not the war junks, these junks, they're doing six bursts of eight damage. That's why you're seeing the galleys die so quickly. It's actually ridiculous how pathetic that unit ends up looking. And... Well, as a result, they won't wait around any longer. They'll finally wave that flag. Grand Galleys, but a pipe dream for now. I, I think there's a world in which they can still be good, but this just was not the one. Definitely not the, the best of comeback units in AOE4.